Tim Larson strolled through the crowd at the Ferguson summer picnic, his daughter Heather by his side, greeting everyone with a warm smile and engaging in friendly conversation. Known as the top maintenance man in the company, Tim dedicated most of his working hours to the factory, ensuring the smooth operation of the complex machinery used to manufacture buffers and accessories. With over 400 employees in the Ferguson family company, Tim was familiar with nearly all of them, and he held a genuine fondness for the majority. The Ferguson Summer Picnic was an eagerly anticipated annual affair, sponsored by Ferguson Manufacturing as a gesture of gratitude to its hardworking staff. Taking place on the third Saturday of July each year, the event consistently drew a large crowd. Attendees enjoyed complimentary food and beverages, along with a variety of family-friendly games and activities. Held at a rented amusement park, the festivities included rides, ice cream treats, games, a spacious pool, and even pony rides for the children. Meanwhile, adults engaged in spirited rounds of volleyball, horseshoes, and badminton, relishing the opportunity to relax, socialize, and unwind. I apologize to you in advance, Heather, Tim said as he looked toward the small pavilion where Edgar Remington was holding a meeting. You can go wait in the car if you want. A 15-year-old kid shouldn't have to hear or see what's about to be said and done. I want to see it with my own eyes, Tim's daughter replied. Mom will turn it around and make you the bad guy. I just need to make sure you see things the way they really are. I admit that mom has been hard to live with lately, but it's not easy to believe that she treated you so badly, especially so openly. I've heard all the words you're going to use. Do what you have to do. Tim nodded grimly, heading toward the pavilion. Heather separated from him and began to make her way to the rear of her mother. Edgar Remington was in the center of the pavilion, he gave a bombastic speech about increasing production and reducing costs. Tim made his way through the crowd and approached his wife, she was sitting next to Edgar and seemed to follow his every word. Tim noticed Mrs. Agnes Ferguson sitting off to the side, sipping a soft drink and watching her husband's father, who had founded the company 50 years ago. Her husband, William, had taken over the company 20 years ago. During his leadership, he had nearly doubled production as well as the profitability of the company. Sadly, William Ferguson suffered a massive heart attack and died the previous winter at the age of 56. At the suggestion of his lawyers and business consultants, Agnes Ferguson appointed Edgar Remington as the company's chief operating officer. He had been a vice president at a Fortune 500 company and received excellent references. Tim began his career with Ferguson Buffers around the time William Ferguson took over the reins of the business from his father. When Tim started his career, it was just two weeks after high school graduation. Over the years, he had developed a great relationship with William Bill Ferguson and really missed Bill's steady hand at the helm. Tim nodded to Mrs. Ferguson before walking over to his wife, Mandy, and saying quietly, Would you join me on the picnic for a bit? We could have a drink and play volleyball. We're talking business here. Why don't you go have a beer and throw horseshoes with your friends from the floor? Remington snapped back. Floor was the term used to describe the part of the company where the actual production work was done. People worked either in the office or on the floor. Those who worked in the office often treated those who worked on the floor as inferior employees. We are not at work, this is a picnic, and I'm going to talk to my wife without your interference, Tim replied calmly, fighting himself not to respond more sharply. I said we're doing business here, Remington repeated. Tim, why don't you go play some of the games with your friends? Mandy suggested, concerned that her husband was about to clash with their boss. Edgar is discussing some business proposals that I'd like to hear, Tim said firmly. Business proposals that don't include service personnel, Remington added with a harsh laugh. You won't understand the theory behind my ideas. Won't you come with me, Mandy? I won't ask again, Tim warned, with a wince. I'm staying here, Tim. Why don't you just go have fun with the other guys from the floor? That was Mandy's cold reply. Yeah, get out of here. We're having a good business discussion and we don't need people from the floor eavesdropping, Remington insisted with an obvious chuckle. You really are a complete idiot, Tim stated clearly, standing up, turning away from his wife, and facing Remington. The next good idea you get, and it will be your first. You're the rudest bastard I've ever had the misfortune to meet. You've really screwed this company up in record time, demanded a furious Remington. What did you call me, demanded a furious Remington. Try to be more careful, Tim replied with a strained smile. Ignorant, rude, and bastard were my basic definitions. 
I can think of a few more if you have trouble understanding those terms. Some of those listening to this exchange took their breath away. Tim Larson just publicly called the company's COO names. You must be drunk, Remington objected, saying that Tim Larson was in no mood to accept his crude authority. I'll forgive you this time out of respect for Mandy, but you'd better leave before I change my mind. I haven't had a drink yet tonight, Tim replied softly. Now that that excuse is gone, why don't you change your wish and go with option number two? Do you want to get fired and kicked out of here? Remington replied, I can do that. Actually, you can't, Tim objected. Not if you don't want to, and can't do it yourself. There's no security at this event, so you're on your own, you cowardly. I'm sure everyone here would love to see you try to throw me out, Tim. I'm coming with you, Mandy burst into the fray in a panic. Please excuse Tim, Edgar. He hasn't been in a good mood lately. I think it's stress. Stress from finding out he has to make half the payments on your new house, Remington teased. He'll have to work overtime and give up playing with his buddies to pay his share. I can. Understand how this situation would stress Timmy out. The only stress I'm under at the moment is keeping my temper in check, Tim replied, giving Remington a glare. I have an almost uncontrollable urge to beat the crap out of you, Remington. As he spoke, Tim clenched his hands into fists and took a step toward the company's COO. How about you, Edgar? Feeling froggy? You're fired, Tim Larson, announced the retreating COO before slamming the back of his knees into a chair and falling on his ass. What's the matter with you, demanded Tim's wife, rushing to help Remington to his feet. Don't bother coming home until you're ready to apologize to both Edgar and me. That's fair enough, Tim replied, looking around the crowd of spectators. He nodded to a young man in Bermuda shorts and a New England Patriots t-shirt. Tim Larson turned away from his wife in Remington as he started walking toward the parking lot. He heard the young man ask Mandy if she was Amanda Larson. Tim did not hear Mandy's response, but the young man's statement, you have been served again, elicited a sigh from the many viewers watching the destruction of his marriage. When Tim reached his truck, he started looking for his keys. As he pulled them out of his pocket, Heather called out to him, Dad, I have to stay with Mom. It sounds like you were ready for anything. Did you ask one of your friends to bring your pickup truck so you wouldn't have to drive home with Mom? Actually, I did, Tim admitted. Your mother had gotten my attention with her plan to buy a new house and make me pay half the mortgage on it. I suspected Remington was behind the idea, now he's pretty much confirmed it. She is not the woman I married years ago, and certainly not the woman I would marry today. Nothing I do is good enough for her. She is pushing me to either work more overtime or find a better job. I make enough money, especially considering your mom's income. I'm not going to spend the best years of my life submitting to an employer like Remington or a spouse like your mother. It sounds like you've made up your mind, Heather said, then added with her usual candor, for what it's worth, I understand. Remington has no respect for you, and neither does mom. You don't need that negativity. Thanks for your support, Heather. I have a place to live, and next week I'll be starting my new job. I'll tell you all about it when the dust settles, Tim promised. Your mom will probably need your emotional support over the next few days. You're entitled to that, Heather agreed. Connie Dawson and Margie Olson tried to reassure her. I'd better go back and give her a shoulder to cry on. It was hard to watch today. But I'm glad I was there and saw how mom and that jerk treated you. She won't be able to tell you any differently about it, at least not to me. You were going to beat up Remington, he was really scared. I'd recognize a fifth point of view on that one, Tim replied with a smirk, climbing into his pickup truck. Thankfully, it didn't come to that. Take care of your mom, honey. Mandy spent the half hour after the divorce papers were served crying in the ladies' room. Heather stayed close by but didn't show the sympathy that her mother felt this tense situation required. As Heather walked with her to the parking lot, Mandy tried desperately to smile at every person she met, even though she was sure many of them were enjoying her misery. What a stunt your father pulled today, Mandy spat out once she and Heather were safely on the highway. He's going to get fired, you know that, right? He'll be looking for a house and a job, all because of his stupid pride. The funny thing is he'd be making better money if he had real pride. Instead, he golfs and fishes, he goes to all my softball and basketball games, he attends all the school events I participate in. All of my friends think he is the best dad in the world, was Heather's immediate response. Why did you leave us to go listen to this airbag brag about how smart he is? 
he's my boss and wanted to discuss some ideas with people in the office. I'm in charge of marketing, so I was expected to attend his impromptu meeting. It was pretty interesting until your dad ruined it. It was a company picnic, even I know not to do business at a company picnic. Mr. Remington was taking advantage of the time of employees who came to relax and have a good time. It sounds like you've been listening to your father a lot, Mandy complained. You're too young to understand finance. People have to work hard to succeed. Your father isn't really a hard worker, he likes to go with the flow, taking the easiest path, having a good time, and not worrying about tomorrow. That's pretty much what that Remington guy told Dad. You seem to share his opinion, coincidence, isn't it? Heather asked sarcastically. It really is. Isn't everyone in the office knows that your father refuses to work overtime? All the time, he could bring home a lot more money, his family could live in a bigger, nicer house with a pool. How did Mr. Remington hear about your idea for Dad to take on half of the mortgage payment for the new house? Heather asked. Mandy looked at her daughter before answering, we may have discussed it at some point. I don't remember exactly, but I think about it often, so I may have asked him to speak up. Mr. Remington is a financial expert, why doesn't he have the sense not to release personal information in public? He had absolutely no respect for dad today, Heather insisted. Maybe your dad didn't do anything to earn his respect, Mandy immediately replied. Mr. Remington is a responsible man and doesn't respect anyone who slacks off, but he seemed to earn his father's respect when he started coming at him with clenched fists, he backed away so quickly that he fell back in his chair. That was ridiculous, it wasn't funny. Your father was out of control, and Mr. Remington was trying to prevent an ugly scene, as a man in his position should, Mandy defended her boss. If he didn't want an ugly scene, he shouldn't have annoyed his father the way he did, Heather pointed out. He was trying to humiliate your husband, and you went along with it. I'm proud of dad for standing up to him, your boss was close to getting his ass kicked today. Maybe Edgar is in pretty good shape, he's been spending a lot of time at the gym. It's a good thing Edgar backed out of the fight, Mandy said. Why did they serve me divorce papers in such a way as to humiliate me as much as possible? Your father planned the whole thing. It takes time to draw up the papers and find someone to serve them, Mandy reasoned. That's true, her daughter agreed. Dad had to think about it for a long time to find a place to live and a new job. It must have taken some time. You, your father found a new job and already found a new place to live, Heather's mother marveled. He might be serious. About getting a divorce. You think so? Heather said ironically. I doubt he'll come back, he hates Remington and doesn't seem to like you very much. He's pissed because I wanted to build a bigger house for our family and expected him to pay his share. That's childish as hell, not to mention irresponsible. I'm not trying to defend my dad, but did he even want a bigger house? Heather asked. He's always been happy with where we live. I like that we live close to school and shopping. You decided we should move to a bigger house, and Dad would have to spend most of his earnings to pay his share. What makes you think he would agree to? That you're really naive about finances and relationships, her worried mother replied. We are looked up to in society, at least I am. It is important that we look successful. Just because I earn twice as much as your father doesn't mean I have to pay for everything while he plays golf and goes fishing. Why is that, Mom? Heather asked. Heather's mom repeated in bewilderment, You're kidding, right? Daddy never complains about the things you buy. I've been shopping with you, so I know how much you can spend in a day. I'm just wondering why you think Daddy shouldn't feel free to do what he likes. Maybe because I pay for everything, Mandy exclaimed. I have a lot of friends with moms who don't work at all. They store, get massages, and even play golf without making a dime. Is that fair? Of course it is, they reasoned. They gave up their careers to raise a family for their husbands. Husbands have a responsibility to keep their wives comfortable. Heather had long ago learned that her mother couldn't be pushed into something she strongly resisted, but she could be gently steered. Ideas had to be given time and nurtured slowly. Heather had planted the seeds, and now she had to wait to see if they would fall on the rocks or blossom. Is Remington your boyfriend, Heather, asked suddenly. You two seem very comfortable with each other. What? Of course not, Edgar replied. I'm a real bachelor. I date all sorts of beautiful women. I'm not interested in her. It sounds as if you are interested in him, Heather said. I just hope you don't start dating him too soon. It'll look like you had an affair with him while you were married to dad. 
I have no romantic interest in Edgar or any other man, Mandy replied. I'm not going to be seeing anyone for a long time. That's assuming that your father and I do get divorced. It's quite possible that he'll come to his senses and apologize. Maybe he'll even beg me to forgive him. Heather looked at her mother as if she had two heads. What planet do you live on? You and Remington are clearly interested in each other, and Dad will never apologize. He didn't do anything wrong. Humiliating me in public is bloody wrong, in my opinion. I don't see how you can defend him. All this drama must be embarrassing for you too, Heather added. Yeah, that's right, especially the part. Where you turned down your father's offer to go enjoy the festivities in order to stay and listen to Remington's ramblings, that was really embarrassing. Mandy turned into her driveway and noticed that Tim's garage door was open. He never had room in his garage for his pickup truck, it was always cluttered with tools and numerous toys. He kept his golf bag, camping and fishing gear, and lawnmower on his side of the garage. Much to Mandy's dismay, the lawnmower and a few gardening tools were all that was left in the garage on Tim's side. It was even cleanly swept. Mother and daughter stopped to survey the scene. Tim's departure was now manifesting itself in the most obvious way. I wonder how much furniture he took, was all Mandy said as she opened the door to the kitchen. A quick look around the house showed that apart from clothes, Tim had taken very little from the house. At least he left the expensive furniture in the living room and my bedroom set, Mandy remarked. Let's see if he tries to go back and get the nice furniture. I think Dad has already taken everything he wants, Heather suggested. He's never liked the furniture we have since you gave his favorite chair to your cousin. That old junk didn't go with anything, it had to go, Mandy explained. He didn't complain when I gave it to him. He told you it was his favorite chair and he wanted to keep it, Heather remembered. You told him to get over it. You also warned him never to sweat or wear his work clothes when he sat on the furniture. Didn't you notice that he always brought a kitchen chair when he wanted to watch TV? Of course I noticed, but that was just him being stubborn. He was trying to make me feel bad by being passive-aggressive, Mandy insisted. I know all his tricks. Yeah, I guess you do, Heather agreed. How do you do it? We'll be fine even if your father doesn't come crawling back, Mandy replied, even as she cringed at her daughter's remark. I earn enough to support us, we don't need his income. That's curious since you kept telling him he needed to make more money. Now I'm totally confused, Heather remarked. I was just trying to encourage him to be more responsible, Mandy replied, both to herself and to Heather. I wanted to be able to be proud of him. It's probably for the best that you're getting divorced, Heather remarked. Dad doesn't seem to like you anymore. You're ashamed of him, and Remington is acting very interested, perhaps. It's only for the best for all of us. Doesn't living with one parent bother you? Tim ran away from you and me, remember that, Mandy cautioned. Mom, I've been living with only one parent for a year now. Dad won't stop seeing me, going to my games, or taking me camping and fishing, Heather replied confidently as she disappeared into her room. Mandy stood, staring at her daughter's bedroom door, mauling over her last statement. It was bad enough that Tim didn't appreciate how hard she worked for her family, but his attitude seemed to have transferred to Heather as well. He had always played the role of the good father to Mandy's bad mother. Heather and Tim both knew that she had too much work to attend Heather's games or school events. She was the marketing director for Ferguson Buffers, and a lot of people depended on her, leaving the company picnic. Tim drove 34 miles to a sprawling campground in a very rural and wooded part of the state. He made arrangements with the owners for what would be their version of a Swiss army knife. His job was to maintain the buildings and equipment. He was also to act as an occasional guide during rafting trips on the nearby river or night hikes in the local mountains. His pay was slightly higher than at Ferguson, and he was given a two-bedroom winter cabin to live in. Tim spent the first week repairing or tuning motorcycles, four-wheelers, and tractors used at the campground. The second week was spent repairing plumbing and electrical in the cabins. The following week he led two river rafting trips while maintaining the sprawling grounds. Tim had plenty of time to think while he worked on the equipment. He regretted not seeing Heather as often as he would have liked. He grudgingly admitted to himself that he was lonely. He was surprised at how much he missed his wife. Mandy was still a beautiful woman with a great figure. No wonder Remington was interested in her. Divorcing Mandy would leave the door open for Remington, but Tim had no control over that. He knew for a fact that he could no longer live with a wife who disrespected him and had practically fallen out of love with him. 
she considered him more of a burden to their marriage than an asset. Unfortunately, Heather would have a single-parent family, but Tim really wanted to be a good role model for his daughter. If he continued to put up with the crap Mandy was spewing at him, Heather might follow her mother's example and become a ball-busting individual in later life. It was important for her to realize that men don't accept that kind of treatment. When she found a husband, she would need to treat him with respect. Tim hoped that was the lesson Heather would learn from their failed marriage to Mandy. Working outside during the summer was a pleasant distraction for Tim. As the weeks went by, he grew slimmer, more tanned, and more like his old self. Whenever he saw Heather, she remarked how great he looked. He let his hair grow out, as he no longer felt obligated to cut it short like Mandy wanted. He enjoyed his job and met many interesting people from all walks of life. He was helping two beautiful young women prepare supplies for a rafting trip when he saw Mandy's BMW pull into the campground and stop next to the pickup truck he was loading. She was giving Heather a ride to spend the weekend with Tim. Heather jumped out of the car, ran up, and gave him a big hug. Daddy, you look so tanned and toned. Have you stopped wearing shirts altogether? I wear them when I eat, Tim laughed, hugging his daughter. Heather, meet Kim and Lisa. They are guests here, we're getting ready to go river rafting. You're coming with us, Heather noticed the beautiful blondes next to her father. They were dressed in shorts and halter tops, and their tops were filled. I'd rather not interfere with your plans, Heather replied, thinking about how her father must be attracted to the beautiful women he was about to accompany. That's not a problem, the girl who was introduced as Kim insisted. We have two kayaks, and both are designed for two people. We also have a pair of tubing kayaks. We'd love to have you on the team. We'll lend you one of our swimsuits if you didn't bring one with you. Thank you, Heather laughs. I appreciate the offer, but I have my own bathing suit. I don't think I could wear a top like yours and keep it on. You both have amazing figures. Don't worry about it. We don't have long to wear tops. Replied a woman named Lisa. I don't think Daddy would let me take mine off, he's old-fashioned. Heather replied, teasing her father. I don't know anything about that, and he didn't seem to mind at all. When we took our tops off on the trip yesterday, did we upset you, Tim? Lisa asked with a sly grin. Not in the slightest, but Heather will have all her important body parts under control when she swims with us. She's only fifteen and too young for that sort of thing, Tim replied with a smirk, and winked at Lisa. So, you won't mind when I turn eighteen? Heather mocked him. You'll be making most of your own decisions by then, so I'd say if you're safe and your pictures aren't all over the internet. It's up to you, Tim replied seriously, and Mandy declared, stepping in front of him, her mother would have something to say about that. I really don't think she should go sailing with those two if they're going to be there naked. In fact, you shouldn't either. You must be the wife who decided to switch husbands, Kim interrupted, eyeing her. Tim is an impeccable gentleman, not to mention he has beautiful eyes. But we'll leave our tops on if it makes you feel better. Mandy listened to Kim but kept her eyes on Tim. He really did look great, his long hair gave him a boyish charm, and his tan shoulders and chest were clear evidence of his manliness. Had he really changed that much, or had he always been so attractive? Both women nodded to each other and then moved to either side of Tim, pressing their gorgeous breasts against his arms. This action made even more of their breasts bulge upwards above their flimsy tops. We'll take care of your husband and daughter, Kim promised, pretending not to notice Mandy's stare. You must be in a hurry, you probably have some important work to discuss with your suave boss. Mandy flashed back to when she realized that Tim had told the women about Edgar, and it was safe to say that he had made their relationship look less than professional. An angry retort was on the tip of her tongue, but she held it back as she walked back to the car. As she drove to the Ferguson Buffer's office, Mandy pondered her situation. Her own daughter had asked her if Edgar was her boyfriend the very day she had been served with the divorce papers. Sue Jensen from accounting suggested that Mandy might be dating Edgar openly since Tim had filed. Even Edgar started acting differently after the company picnic, he was now constantly touching her back, complimenting her looks, and berating Tim every chance he got. Everyone assumed that she and Edgar were either already together or would be soon. Mandy marveled at Edgar's success as well as his command of the situation. She admitted to herself that Edgar was a very attractive man, but she had never had the urge to give up her marital vows to be with him. She told herself that while Tim was indeed an underachiever, he had many good qualities. He was an excellent father, he was handsome and seemed to be getting even more handsome, 
he always treated Mandy's parents and other relatives with respect. He never got drunk, never did drugs, and Mandy was sure that he had always remained faithful to her. Mandy remembered her father being as upset as she had ever seen him when Heather explained to her parents that Tim had filed for divorce. After a few clarifying questions, Heather explained how Mandy had wanted to buy a new house and had insisted that Tim pay half of the mortgage from his paycheck. What were you thinking? Her father angrily demanded an answer. This man paid for your last two years of college and your advanced business degree. He's the best father. I've ever seen that goes for me too. He is honest, loyal, clean, neat, and has always treated you like a freaking queen. Maybe that's the problem. Was he too malleable? Did you lose respect for him because he always let you get your way? Do you have another man in mind? Mandy's father asked suspiciously. Mandy shook her head in the negative, so her father immediately turned his attention to Heather. What did you see or hear, Heather? Dad thought Mom was overly impressed with the guy who was now running Ferguson Buffers. She was always talking about him, how smart and handsome he was. He calls Mom a lot, they have long conversations. Yeah, now that Heather brought it up. I noticed that you seem to be really into this guy. You mentioned him several times at our 4th of July meeting, Mandy's mother reminded her in a concerned tone. Honey, have you been unfaithful? Her mother said before she burst into loud sobs. Mom, of course not. I never cheated on Tim, and I never would. I just wanted him to be more responsible and work harder to support his family, Mandy explained. I never stopped loving him, he's the one who filed for divorce after you drove him to it, her father spat. You managed to find a good husband, and you decided he wasn't good enough. How much money do you need? I know you make a damn good salary, her father continued. That's not the point, Dad, Mandy insisted. He must want Heather and me to be proud of him. He's content to be a maintenance man. How do you think Heather and I feel when people ask us what Tim does? Wait a minute, Heather intervened eagerly. I'm very proud of my dad. All my friends think he's the best dad ever. They all like him, he always attends all games and school events. Don't drag me into this, Mandy threw her daughter a threatening look before explaining to her father. Dad, he's capable of so much more. He's smart, strong, handsome, and nice to be around. He could go a long way if he just tried, Mandy reasoned. I see, Mandy's father stated nodding his head in agreement. Your husband is smart, nice, and handsome, so naturally, you need to push him away to give yourself a chance to find the holy grail among husbands. I bet there are plenty of women who would be willing to settle for Tim's looks and character. Grandpa, you should see how other girls' moms act when dad is around. Single moms have become especially friendly since they found out she and mom were divorcing, Heather recalled. I'm the real dude in the family, but everyone thinks Tim is cute, Mandy complained bitterly. He wouldn't look so nice to everyone if we had to live in a shack and eat ramen noodles. Tim brings home more than I do. We raised three kids and made it through, her father remarked. You just wouldn't be driving around in that beamer and wearing new clothes all the time. Your mom had to scrape by from time to time, and she never complained. She supported me even when I screwed up and did things that hurt us financially. I was the luckiest guy in the world when she agreed to marry me. I'm not a mom, okay? I want more than to settle for the bare minimum. I want to have a husband I can be proud of, Mandy replied, marveling at how much her parents loved each other. At the campground, Lisa and Kim released Tim's hands as soon as Mandy left, then both women started laughing heartily. Heather looked at them confused. Lisa and I are in a serious relationship, Kim explained. We didn't go sailing with your father yesterday, and he's never laid eyes on our girls unless he was peeking through our window last night. You really made your mom retort, Heather stated with a chuckle. She's not acting like a woman who wants a divorce, is she? Your dad is pretty hot for a man, Lisa stated. Your mom is an attractive woman, but what is she thinking? Tim is a great guy. When Mandy arrived at Ferguson Buffers for Saturday's meeting, she was surprised to see only one car parked in the parking lot, Ender's car. Where is everyone? Mandy asked as she entered the meeting room. I canceled the meeting. I notified the others last night. I thought it would be a great time for us to get to know each other a little better, Edgar said. This isn't the time or place for personal business, replied an irritated Mandy. I came all this way on a Saturday morning for a meeting you cancelled yesterday. I have things to do at home. You said your daughter was spending the weekend with her deadbeat dad.
and I thought it was the perfect time for us to get together, Remington reasoned, placing his hand on Mandy's back and continuing to gently rub her shoulders. I have us booked for a conference in Chicago in two weeks, Remington continued. I thought we could save the company money by renting just one room. The conference would be Saturday morning, but we could leave Friday afternoon and return Monday morning. That would give us a romantic work weekend. Edgar, this is all so sudden. I need time to think it over, Mandy replied, struggling to think of an appropriate response. Of course you do, Remington murmured. You think it over, but plan to spend this weekend with me in Chicago. You'll love it, I know how to show a lady what a good time is, if you know what I mean. Mandy was almost in tears as she drove home, her life was falling apart. Tim felt betrayed and disrespected, so he was divorcing her. Heather took the divorce too lightly, she hinted that she had only had one parent for a while, meaning Mandy was not a very good mother. Her parents were resentful of her attitude toward Tim, everyone thought Tim was a good guy and a great husband. Edgar had just announced his intentions to sleep with her during a business trip scheduled in two weeks. Turns out, Tim was right about him, he told her to keep Remington at a distance because he wanted to get in her panties, and Tim was having a lot of fun. He accompanied two incredibly sexy women on a river rafting trip where they took off their tops and displayed their big breasts in front of him. He could even sleep with both of them, and maybe even at the same time. Just the thought made Mandy sick to her stomach. If Tim could get over her so quickly, why couldn't she enjoy an affair with Edgar in Chicago? He was handsome and very successful, he was exactly the kind of man Mandy had envisioned as a husband. Then Mandy began to worry about what Heather would think when she found out her mother was involved with Remington, especially after all her denials. Things had gotten more complicated since Tim decided he'd rather get a divorce than be married to Mandy and live on her terms. Why couldn't he just make more money and support his family better? As the thought crossed her mind, Mandy remembered Heather questioning her about why she wanted Tim to work so hard when she made enough money to support her family. Mandy's own father had said that Tim was a good husband and the best father in the world. She didn't realize how highly Tim was regarded by her family, they didn't seem to care that he worked for the same company where she was the marketing director. Why couldn't they realize how awkward it all was? Tim brought Heather home on Sunday night, she walked through the door smiling and clearly pleased with her weekend. Seeing her daughter so happy made Mandy depressed again. Why does a daughter who adores her father upset her so much? Shouldn't Mandy be happy about their relationship? Is your father in too much of a hurry to get back to his big-breasted girlfriends to stop by for a few minutes? Mandy complained. It wouldn't hurt if he talked to me once in a while. We do have a daughter in common, don't we? Heather sensed her mother's mood and decided to hold her unhappy, maybe she would start to realize how handsome Tim really was. Dad was really very impressed with Lisa and Kim. I know he didn't sleep with them last night because my bedroom door was open, and I would have heard him leaving and coming back. He wouldn't dare bring them into the cabin while I was there, he knows how noisy you made love. I doubt that Kim and Lisa are the quiet and peaceful ones in bed, Mandy replied indignantly. Not in the last year or so, but when I was younger, you used to wail and moan quite loudly, Heather recalled. I didn't mind it. I thought it was really great that my mom and dad loved each other so much. Well, I'm sorry if we disturbed you, Mandy apologized. I didn't realize you could hear me, Mom. I didn't mind at all, really. Sarah was staying over one night, and she heard you squealing. She thought it was great that my parents loved each other so much. Her parents are divorced. Lisa and Kim were a lot of fun. I really liked them. They treated me like a little sister, and we really bonded, Heather admitted with a smile. Speaking of getting things off, did they at least keep their tops on? Mandy inquired. It's a pretty isolated section of the river, so no one saw them topless. They were covered when we docked, Heather replied, choosing her words carefully to make it seem like two beautiful women were topless in front of Tim. Over the next work week, the situation became even more confusing for Mandy. On Monday afternoon, one of the most profitable and productive machines on the floor stopped working properly. It was working, but the quality of the product it was producing was far below what was required. Agnes Ferguson never failed to attend the Wednesday afternoon management meeting. She turned over the day-to-day -day operations to Remington but had too much business acumen to ignore the family business. She kept a close eye on the company's production and profits. After the maintenance supervisor made his report, Agnes began asking pointed questions. Why is it taking so long to get number 27 back in service, Steve? 
it's one of our most productive and profitable machines. I don't remember us ever having this kind of problem before. It's hard for us to pinpoint exactly what the problem is. The machine is running, but the quality of the output is not up to standard. Two people have been working on it since Monday, the man replied. Is this something new, something that has never happened before? Agnes asked, continuing her original question. Not exactly. It's one of our older machines, and it's known to do this once or twice a year, replied the service technician. I think I missed something in your explanation, Steve. Unless this is a completely unheard of problem, why is it taking so long to fix it? This time, well, ah, uh, the situation has changed, and the guys are having a hard time figuring out why the machine isn't working properly, Steve Snark said. What exactly has changed that prevented this machine from being back in working order before, if you don't mind my asking, the impatient owner asked. Well, we don't have Tim Larson anymore. He knew this machine by heart. He'd spend an hour or two adjusting it, and it would run like new for months, Steve admitted with some reluctance. I see, was all Agnes said, looking at each person in the room. I noticed that this year the management gave themselves several bonuses for improved production and profits. Did any of the employees on the floor receive any bonuses? After all, they are the ones who actually produce something. We have employee appreciation days when we meet or exceed our goals each month, Remington replied. Pizza or even a barbecue is delivered to the lunchroom. The employees really appreciate the gesture. Those in maintenance and production get a slice of pizza or ribs for meeting or exceeding company goals. Does management get generous checks? Agnes asked rhetorically. Al, Mandy, did Tim ever talk about how he appreciated the bonus pizza? Agnes asked softly. You know Tim, he made it another reason he didn't want to take overtime. He complained that he was getting a slice of pizza while the office was getting bonuses. He said it was an incentive for him not to work overtime, Mandy told us. That's exactly why he doesn't work here anymore, Remington was quick to point out. Ferguson Buffers does not need or want poorly performing employees, Mr. Remington. Tim Larson was exactly the kind of employee this company needed and wanted. He was dependable and very capable. My husband often told me that Tim managed to get more done in an eight-hour shift than any other person he had ever hired. Underestimating Tim Larson's value to the company was a serious mistake. He was probably the most valuable employee we had. Mandy couldn't help but be surprised and amazed at how highly Ferguson valued Tim. Apparently, Bill Ferguson loved Tim more than Mandy could imagine. Had Tim somehow deceived her parents, the Fergusons, Heather, and most of the Ferguson Buffer employees? The only possible explanation pointed to the fact that it was Mandy who was the very stupid woman. Could you ask Tim to call me, Mandy? Agnes Ferguson asked gently. He must have changed his number, I can't get through to him. Of course, Mrs. Ferguson, replied a surprised Mandy. He has a new phone, but my daughter has his number. I'll ask her to ask him to call you. Thank you, my dear, Agnes Ferguson replied kindly and looked at Edgar Remington. I am sorry for your marital failings. I'm afraid our company may have contributed to the situation. Not at all, Mrs. Ferguson. All our problems are Tim's and mine alone, Mandy assured her, pondering what Agnes Ferguson was implying. Tim was surprised when Heather told him that Mrs. Ferguson wanted him to call her, but he immediately dialed her number. He had a lot of respect for Agnes and her late husband, Bill. Thanks for calling, Tim. I hope you like your new job, Remington said. I tried to throw a wrench in your retirement papers, but everything was filled out, signed, and turned into HR before you ran off to our picnic, Agnes reported. That was a good idea on your part. I would have stepped in if it had been necessary, but your planning ahead made it unnecessary. I hate to ask, but I need a favor from you. If I can do it, I will, Tim promised. You and Bill have always been very good to me and my family. Can I hire you to do some consulting for our company? We're having problems with a few cars, and I've been given to understand that you're the best candidate to fix them. You can't hire me, but I will come in tomorrow for a couple of hours and see how I can help you, Tim replied kindly. Thank you so much, Tim. According to insurance and other regulations, we need to have a signed contract before you can work on the floor. Are you sure there's nothing I can do to thank you? How about a gift certificate or something? Agnes suggested. Tim pondered Agnes's suggestion. He had been separated from Mandy for weeks now, and he really wanted to know how she was doing. Heather had informed him as well as she could, 
but Tim knew there were many things he would pick up on from Mandy's body language and words that Heather would miss. Now that you mention it, I have a request, Tim admitted with a chuckle. Could you ask Mandy to invite me to do the work she wants me to do? Don't tell her I've already agreed, just explain that you've thought about it and decided that the request would be better received if she asked for it herself. Tim, I refuse to participate in any scheme for revenge or payback. I'm sorry you're in this situation, but I will not set Mandy up and make you grovel in any way, Agnes Ferguson stated firmly. That's why I respect you so much, Tim replied. The real truth is pretty pathetic. I really miss her. I haven't spoken more than a few words to her since your company picnic. I understand now, Agnes said sympathetically. I'll ask her to call you as soon as we hang up. Please don't upset her. I think she is beginning to understand things better. Two minutes later, Tim's phone rang. He let it ring a few times before answering. Tim, it's Mandy. How are you doing? Mandy, what a surprise. I was just thinking about you. I'm fine. Is Heather okay? Is there a problem? Heather's fine. There's a little problem. But why were you thinking about me? Mandy asked with some trepidation. I was sitting here eating a burger and beans, thinking about what wonderful meals you always cooked for us. You're one of the best cooks I know, Tim bragged. So, you miss my cooking? A disappointed Mandy asked. I guess it wasn't good enough to keep us together. To be honest, I miss a few other things, Tim continued, before adding, how are you doing with no one around to nudge, push, and coax you to make more money? I'm doing about as well as could be expected after being served divorce papers in front of all my coworkers. I'm trying to cope, Mandy revealed. I realize that this may have been extreme, and I apologize for the prank. I was angry and wanted to hurt you back. It wasn't my finest moment, and I do feel guilty. You deserve so much better, Tim concluded. I would have been much happier if you had done it at home, if you had to do it at all. I never realized things were so bad between us. Was I so unbearable that you thought divorce was the only way out? Mandy asked. Couldn't you have discussed it with me? Did you ask my opinion about buying a new house or how I felt about paying half the mortgage? Did you listen to my concerns about how many hours you work and how much time you spend with Remington? Tim asked. I don't remember you wanting to listen to anything I had to say. I certainly did listen, Tim. I just felt you were avoiding the responsibility of taking care of your family. You have a lot of potential, but you've settled for being a fixer, Mandy explained. You've just summed up the reason we're getting divorced, Tim stated. I told you how my father missed all my school activities because he was always working. Then he had a massive heart attack and died at the age of 39. He missed everything, and it was all for nothing. I promised myself that I would never do what he did. I explained all this to you before we got married. Yes, Tim, I thought I understood, but I guess I don't. I'm trying to gauge your feelings about it, but when I was served with the divorce papers and saw you with those two beautiful women, it didn't really improve my outlook, Mandy replied. Welcome to my world, Tim replied a little sarcastically. All you've talked about is how wonderful Edgar Remington is since he joined the company. Then you announced that we were getting a bigger house and my salary would pay half of the new mortgage. You didn't even ask my opinion on something as important as buying a house and moving, but you obviously asked Remington's opinion. I will not tolerate that kind of treatment from my wife, much less that Remington. I worked for Ferguson, but they didn't own me. That had no reason to think he could give me orders on his own time. I never tried to tell you that the money I made while you went to college was mine. For some reason, you had the belief that the money you make is yours, the money I make is ours, and I didn't make enough for us. This is a very fundamental difference in our views. I am proud of your accomplishments, I've always been proud of you but I've never felt that we were in competition. I've always felt that our income is our income, belonging to both of us. You enjoy your work, and that's fine. I enjoy my free time, especially the time I spend with Heather. I used to enjoy the time with you, but that is pretty much dried up. I admit that Edgar went overboard at the party, Mandy reluctantly agreed. I'm beginning to realize that I made a huge mistake when I was considering buying a new house. You've always gone along with what I wanted, so I figured that would be the case this time. Buying a house is not like deciding what color to paint your kitchen, Mandy. I always agreed with you on things that didn't really matter to me, but you kept overreacting. I stopped asking you to take off work and come to Heather's games. I stopped asking you to go fishing or golfing or camping. 
it became obvious that you were consumed with your career. I decided that if it made you happy and was so important to you, then I shouldn't stand in your way. You didn't give me the same courtesy, you started pestering and complaining about my job and my income. I wished you were more like me, but I realized that wasn't what you wanted and left it at that. You demanded that I be like you and my father by working longer and harder. We were already making very good money, working harder is not what I want. I'm not going to give up what I think is important in life to please you, especially when you're hardly ever satisfied anyway," Tim added. Wow, Tim. I didn't realize you thought I was so grumpy. I truly believed it was what was best for our family. I never felt any personal attraction to Edgar, other than admiration for his leadership skills. You had no reason to think I would ever be unfaithful to you. Did I then badly misread the signs because I thought you were interested in him? Some people at Ferguson asked me how I could even be in the same building as Remington when that dog was sniffing around my wife. I laughed it off and told everyone I had faith in my wife, but somewhere along the way, my faith started to fade. Tim admitted, I'll tell you something else, Tim added, Remington is seriously letting Ferguson down. He doesn't plan ahead, he's blowing equipment to the wind for short-term results. Perhaps he plans to leave for a more lucrative job in a few months after he improves his resume. The results look great now but in a year or less, there's going to be a price to pay for everything. Ferguson buffers will have a hard time fulfilling orders and retaining customers. Quality is declining, and morale is pretty low. Your hero is totally screwed, and he'd like to ride you before he leaves for pastures new. You insulted both Edgar and me with that rude statement, Mandy replied angrily. He's a wonderful man, and he's doing a great job. Our production numbers have gone up every month since he arrived. Keep telling yourself that he's not trying to get in your panties, at least until he succeeds. I hope my pension doesn't go down the drain when he ends up having company, and you, Tim said heatedly. Tim, this is going nowhere. I called because Agnes Ferguson asked me to get in touch with you. She'd appreciate if you'd come in and take a look at one of the production machines, the repairmen can't seem to get it to work properly. Arguing before asking for a favor is counterproductive, to say the least. Will you do it for Agnes? I'll do it, but not for Agnes. It will be for you, Tim replied. I know that the success of the company means a lot to you. I'll come tomorrow morning, I'm going to play tennis with Heather tomorrow afternoon, so I'll be gone by three. Who would have thought I'd like tennis? If it's a sport or some kind of game, you'll like it, Mandy replied, smiling as she pictured Tim playing tennis. You really looked fit and tan when I dropped Heather off the other day. Looks like it's working out for you. You looked pretty hot yourself, Tim agreed. Did you get a boob job? They look bigger than usual. So did you look? I'm surprised you even noticed my breasts after seeing those two gorgeous blondes. To answer your question, I have lost weight, mostly in my stomach area, so my breasts look bigger. I haven't had much of an appetite lately, Mandy admitted. Don't lose it again, Tim cautioned. You really do look beautiful now. Thanks, Tim. I appreciate you noticing and being thoughtful enough to mention it. I'll see you tomorrow on the floor. Thanks for your help, Agnes will be very happy to hear about it. Okay, see you then. Make sure she knows I'm doing this as a favor for you, Tim insisted before cutting the call short. The next morning, Tim returned to his old haunt on the floor at Ferguson's Buffers. He was explaining to Agnes that he had fixed the problems with the 27 car. You mean these people were with you when you were setting this machine up, but they still don't know how to make it work right? Agnes Ferguson asked as she and Tim watched the 27 run like new. Listen to the way it purrs, it's amazing. In their defense, it's not something I can explain or teach, Tim replied. I listen and observe the machine, making adjustments until it sounds and looks right. They need to learn to listen to what the machine is telling them, this seems to be the stumbling block for most repairmen. You were able to fix the problem in less than two hours, we've had it for days with no results, said Agnes. We really miss you here, Ferguson has always been a great place to work. You and Bill have always been good to me. I know how refusing overtime has pissed Bill off a few times, but I have to live with myself and my actions. Watching my father work his whole life was a lesson I will never forget. I admire you for being able to set priorities and stick to them, Agnes replied. You always worked hard when you were here and never took advantage of Bill's friendship. If we could have sons, I would want them to be like you, Agnes added. After a while, Agnes decided to visit Mandy in her office. 
she managed to hide her annoyance when she saw Remington sitting on the corner of Mandy's desk. Tim has made some adjustments to the 27 and it's working better than ever, Agnes praised. It took him less than two hours to get back in service, even after other people messed it up even more. Instead of fixing it, he told me he only came because you asked him to. Too bad he quit and left Mandy unsupported when she asked him to carry his share home, Remington grinned. Tim asked Agnes to tell Mandy that he was only there because she'd asked him, even though Tim had already promised Agnes that he'd stop by, Agnes went along with it because she was sure he still loved his wife. If she could help smooth their rift, she would. Remington's comment struck her as petty and demeaning. She had been watching the man more closely since Tim had expressed his opinion at the company picnic. As usual, Tim's assessment turned out to be quite accurate. Your interest in Larson's personal life is unprofessional, it borders on harassment. It's inappropriate, and personally, I find it disgusting why Mandy tolerates your derogatory comments about her husband, I don't understand. Don't make the mistake of saying something like that in my presence again, Agnes said before leaving the room. I seem to have hit a nerve, Remington remarked. She likes that loser, and she's the boss. I better get back to work. As soon as Edgar left her office, Mandy thought about how Agnes Ferguson had stood up for Tim, and she'd kept quiet. Why had the owner of the company been so quick to stand up for Tim while his own wife had meekly allowed herself to be disrespected? There was a day when she would have pounced on anyone who humiliated Tim. Remington constantly put Tim down, and she not only accepted it but acquiesced to it. The possibility that Tim had reason to be upset crossed her mind, and not for the first time. The following Wednesday, at the manager's meeting, things began to heat up. Steve, the maintenance supervisor, reported that the 27 is back up and running very well. There had been an increase in minor problems with other production machines, but his staff had been able to keep downtime to a minimum. Edgar Remington then spoke, there is a conference in Chicago this weekend. Mandy and I are flying out and attending it. I think it will be good for cutting costs and expanding our sales. I'm sorry, Mr. Remington, Mandy interrupted. I thought I explained to you that I would not be attending this conference. It must have slipped my mind. I already have plans for the weekend. You do? Remington asked in surprise. It's a wonderful opportunity. It may never come again. I can assure you that I'm not interested in the opportunity you described to me in such glowing terms, Mandy replied. Good, snorted Remington. I would have thought that our company's marketing director would be more interested in improving our bottom line, but I can handle that myself. In fact, I'm very concerned about our bottom line. I'd like to ask Steve a few questions, if I may. Addressing her question to Agnes Ferguson after her nod, Mandy turned her attention to the head of maintenance. Has there been any scheduled maintenance on our vehicles over the last few months? Are you following the established schedule for the machines on the floor? Well, not completely, Steve replied nervously. We skipped a few since everything was working so well and there were no problems. By not stopping the machine for a shift every month, we have increased production. That's what we strive for, isn't it? Why did you make a maintenance schedule if it wasn't important? Agnes asked immediately, recognizing Mandy's concern. Tim Larson persuaded your husband to agree to it years ago, and we've always followed it, Steve replied. What happened that made you change this procedure? Mandy asked. Mr. Remington told me to skip every other scheduled maintenance stop to increase productivity, replied Steve. That worked too, Remington intervened. Look at our numbers. They don't lie. Steve, didn't number 14 go out of service yesterday afternoon? What happened, and how long will it be idle? Mandy persisted. The bearings on the big or roller had blown. By the time the operator noticed it, the roller was ruined. We ordered a new one. It should be delivered in a week or less. We should be able to install. It and reassemble the machine in one shift, Steve predicted. Agnes Ferguson raised her eyebrows upon hearing this information and nodded her thanks to Mandy. Steve, you will go back to the maintenance schedule that my husband and Tim developed, and you will adhere to it strictly. Do you understand? Not long after the meeting ended, Edgar Remington burst into Mandy's office and slammed the door shut. What the kind of stunt was that today? You never told me you weren't going to Chicago this weekend. That maintenance schedule made me look like an idiot. No, Mr. Remington, I was a damn idiot, but I'm getting smarter. I hope it's not too late. Now get your ass out of my office, demanded Mandy. You stupid fool, Remington scolded, 
I'm the goddamn boss. Boss, clean up your desk and get the hell out, you're fired. Remington was surprised to see Mandy smile at him before returning to her seat and speaking into the intercom, which appeared to have already been turned on. Please call security to my office, Becky. No sooner had Mandy uttered those words than the door to her office swung open, Agnes Ferguson entered followed by two men. Mr. Remington, your services are no longer required here. Please collect any personal items you may have on your desk and report to Human Resources, they're waiting for you there. These gentlemen will see to it that you follow my instructions. You're firing me. I've increased production, this place is more profitable than ever, Remington exclaimed incredulously. In the short term, you may be right, but you are damaging the morale of the company and sacrificing future production for quick profits. This is not sound business practice. Besides, I don't like you very much. Please, please leave now. As soon as Remington was let out of the office, Agnes thanked Mandy. I appreciate you bringing these service issues to my attention at the meeting. I'm very glad that you uncovered even more serious workplace harassment issues after the meeting. It was obvious that Remington had his eye on you, but I didn't think he would do something as blatant as offering to spend a weekend in Chicago at company expense. Neglecting maintenance is a death sentence for a manufacturing company, Agnes added. He had to go. Do you think Tim would consider coming back to work here? I really screwed things up with Tim, Mandy admitted. I kept thinking that he had to change so that I could be proud of him, even though I already had every reason to be proud of him. I'm going to try to get him to stop the divorce this weekend. Saturday morning, Tim was loading his pickup truck for the trip to the float plane when Mandy pulled into the parking lot with Heather. The daughter hugged her father and nodded to her mother, who was standing off to the side. Tim, can we talk? Mandy asked crushingly. There are some things I'd like to discuss. I really don't have time, Mandy. I'm taking someone on a floating excursion, she'll be here any minute, and I'm not ready yet. It's going to have to wait, Heather. Get your stuff, you're coming with me. It'll just be the three of us this time, Tim added. No, Dad, it will just be the two of you, Heather said. I'll stay here in the pool, don't worry about me. I'm the customer, Tim, Mandy said. It's all paid for, and I expect to get full service for my money, Heather insisted. She'll be fine in the pool, Heather said. It was almost dark when Heather heard the laughter of her parents entering the cabin. She hurried to the front room to see how they were doing but stopped when their conversation caught her interest. I can't believe you let me float down the river where there was a bend with all those people on the bank. There was a boat launching area and all kinds of people there. You should have known they would see me, Mandy insisted. Hey, I didn't ask you to take your bikini top off at all. I didn't even know you still had a bikini top, Tim replied. You looked really sexy when you smiled and waved at those guys standing there with their jaws sagging to their knees. You really are a beautiful woman. How did those two blondes manage to keep their big breasts from being seen by every guy within a 100-mile radius when they went down the river with you? Mandy asked, I thought the river was pretty deserted. They kept people from seeing their grandiose busts by just covering them up, albeit somewhat inadequately, replied Tim with a smirk. What makes you think no one will see you? This river is pretty busy this time of year. Heather. Mandy called out, where are you? I was just taking a nap, mom. Somehow I get the impression that my humble and very successful mom paddled down the river in a canoe with a bear bust and she was also seen by a lot of people. That's pretty embarrassing for me. What happens? When I go back to school and my friends ask me about my mom showing her boobs to the world, how could you do that to me, mom? Mandy asked, struggling to keep her face straight. You were the one who told me that those two big-breasted blondes went topless down the river in front of Tim, young lady you said it was why did you lie to me Mandy demanded an answer I only told you. That no one had seen them topless, and it was a very isolated part of the river, as I recall, Heather replied with a smirk, and that was the truth. Why didn't you tell me you had an uncontrollable urge to show off your breasts to dad? What were you even thinking I hope you respect dad enough to realize that he needs more than your bare breasts to make him forget all the bad things you said to him, right dad? I have no idea what you're talking about, Tim said, looking puzzled. I don't remember anything except going down the river. Oh, dad, are you so shallow, so pathetic, so easily charmed by your mother's breasts that you can't think for yourself? Heather teased him. No, my mind is finally clear, Tim replied, holding out the money to Heather. Here's a 20. I think you should go get a hamburger and fries at that place across the highway. 
I also think your mom and I need to get some rest and go to bed early. The next morning, Heather was sitting at the kitchen table when Mandy came out of Tim's bedroom wearing one of his shirts. She stopped when she saw her daughter looking at her. What was all? Mandy said. Heather continued to stare until Mandy finally broke down. Okay, I made a little noise. There's nothing I can do about it. It's your father's fault. Oh, mom. Heather exclaimed, throwing herself into her mother's arms. Does this mean you and daddy are back together? It means that we will be, if we work on keeping our promises. I won't tell your dad about his job or that we need a bigger house anymore. I will work on showing him how proud I am of him. He will make an effort to dress well and accompany me to corporate events and social gatherings, looking absolutely beautiful so that everyone will envy me. We will spend more time together, and with you. I was wrong to be so stubborn about so many things, Tim added as he entered the room. If wearing a suit and tie once in a while will make your mom proud, proud to be seen with me, I'll do it, he promised. I wouldn't regret it. That's too much information, Daddy, Heather exclaimed. I had to listen to her meowing and yelping all night. I think I might be morally scarred for life. Well, you better get used to it or wear earplugs, suggested Tim. I'm going to go back to my old job and ask Agnes for a raise. Your mom seems to think I'll get one, and it's quite likely that her screams will continue. In fact, they might even intensify. 